this is the fifth episode of Inside Art Live, the online ser uh, interview series of uh, the industry conference called Inside Art, organized by Art Market Budapest, Central and Eastern Europe's uh, leading contemporary art fair. My name is Christina Löbel, and I will be your host today. We brought you a very interesting and timely topic for today. Uh, actually, it's two topics um, interrelating. One of them is the digitalization of the art market uh, in general, and the impact of the COVID-19 um, pandemic um, in this process, on this process. I am really excited to welcome and introduce Ria Ville, expert of digital strategy uh, in arts in London, who is working at the intersection of technology and the arts. With more than 12 years experience in sales and strategy, while having been a team member at uh, well-known art institutions like the Sotheby's, uh, Artnet and Artsy, she recently decided to, do, to go um, to become a freelancer. She is now helping her clients to pursue and implement digital transformations and cutting edge in, in innovation. Among others, Surya currently advises Bytecube, one of the world's leading contemporary art galleries based in London and in Hong Kong. Let me welcome Surya. Hi, Surya, how are you? Hi. Hi, hi, hi. Um, did you manage to collect some summer uh, adventures after this horrible spring we had? You know, I don't know that I'd call it adventure, but um, we we did manage to leave London, which was an adventure in itself. And um, we went back to uh, where I grew up in Switzerland and actually just the the normality of the summer almost felt like a, a vacation. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> you, so you live in London now. Um, how is the coronavirus situation developing um, in the UK at the moment? Uh, for example, in Hungary, the current situation is significantly different than from the first wave because now everybody returned from um, holidays, from abroad, from homeland, children went back to school. So cases and the um, um, infections are significantly rising. What is the situation over there? Um, I think much the same. People are being encouraged to go back to the office. Uh, schools are opening. I think they haven't really figured out a correct process or I don't even know if there is one for, for teaching children in a classroom. Um, and cases are rising and uh, I, yeah, I think it's probably just a matter of time before things in in, in England also start um, clamping down again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully a little while, not yet. <laughs> Possibly to different extents, but all of us were um, affected in the spring outbreak and we are, as you said, uh, in ascending in the doorway of the second wave, um, well, all over the world. Uh, you are a freelancer and a proud mom of a toddler. I heard. Um, did COVID and the lockdown affect your professional life in a way and routines remarkably? And and based on the, the experience you had in in, um, in spring, do you have you prepared a master plan to tackle with the, the things this time <laughs> and keep the things on the normality track? I mean, we definitely don't have a master plan. I think every parent is just uh, figuring it out as they go. Um, the the lockdown coincided with uh, a sudden urgency in in what I do in in digital in the arts and yes. so it sort of intensified and accelerated any project I was working on just as our daughter came back from nursery so I would say it it was very challenging. Yeah. <laughs> it was very challenging and we had to become very very good at time management. Yeah, but hopefully no more surprises. <laughs> hopefully no more surprises. Um, and hopefully the nursery stays open. If, yeah, if, yeah, yeah. if there is truly another lockdown here, um, I guess our master plan is to go back to Switzerland um, to stay with my mother. Okay. Well, <laughs> keep your fingers crossed. Keep my fingers it's a plan. Crossed. Yeah. So as I said in my introduction, uh, you have more than a decade's uh, experience in the field of art sales and strategy. You've worked in New York, in Hong Kong, in London, so basically all over the world when art is done, made, and, and, and bought. Uh, and you've worked for companies like Artnet and the Sotheby's and the Artsy. And now you're a freelancer. Um, 
what does a freelancer consultant do on this on in this um, in this field what do you focus on now and how do you utilize all your skills your earlier experience uh, with your current clients like for example white cube yeah so um i guess what what i'm doing right now is leveraging the digital tools that we have after many years of innovation um to to reimagine how to experience art and share art online and really focus on elevating the quality of the art that we're sharing online. And I think, I mean, I learned so many things. Uh, Artnet and Artsy uh, were trailblazers in their day, especially Artnet um, for things like price transparency. Um, you, you know, they were they were kind of pioneers for that. and. And Artsy was incredible because I got to be the first to establish a presence in Asia. And living in Asia really taught me how, how much ahead they are. Asians just, they are so tech savvy. The power of WeChat, um, you know, they're doing things in Asia that the West hasn't even conceived of yet in terms of how they sell, how they, explore and discover and i think what i also learned was working for a company that had a headquarters in new york and i was based out of hong kong that if you don't have a truly international group managing a company you cannot be an international brand successful mm -hmm. and so there was always a, a big divide between you know what was coming out of asia and then what was happening in new york headquarters Oh, I see. Oh, let's go back a little later to the um, to the Asian experience because I'm really excited about that. That especially when we will talk about a little some tips and hints and advice for our uh, for ourselves and for our galleries as well. But um, let's stay uh, now uh, with your current work. Um, I'm pretty positive that our audience would love to have a little peep in into your job without, of course, the business secret. Don't disclose them. Uh, and let's say I'm a complete outsider. Okay, so. Um, if uh, a client approaches you um, for your professional help and services, what are they searching for exactly? I think what a lot of these more traditional, I mean, the art world is very traditional in their, their channels. They depend on live experiences, physical art fairs, live gallery shows, live auctions. And, um, with the pandemic, what we saw was an over-dependence on this type of a channel. And so what a lot of these companies need to work on now is how to develop an online presence that complements their offline presence. And the two should work together and complement each other and, and never be separate of each other either. And a lot of times it's just identifying sort of the the opportunities and and the tools needed to tell that story online. Okay, that sounds very interesting. Um, do you have any special methods or anything that is like kind of a little secret, but of course not so much <laughs> something that is, you know, that's something that only you can do or uh, that, that added value that, that you can give them? Any method or anything? <laughs> I hope there's lots of I... I, th I think, as you, as you said before, what maybe perhaps I might say is unique uh, about what I've done and learned is that I've been able to learn in New York, London, and Hong Kong, three different markets who, even London to New York, there are different methods of work and different styles and interactions, both online and offline. And I think having that, that global experience then means that when I look at an issue or a project, I perhaps see it in a, in a more global view than if if I'd only focused in one city. Okay, so that that even works with clients who are work locally because you can give them a, like a broader view. Right, or... right. And the beauty of digital is that you can reach a wider audience, but you need to know how to reach them and it's okay. not just a matter of putting yourself online it's 
It's what you do when you're there. Right. I'm really curious about it now, but <laughs> after, after the life, <laughs> the secrets. All right, let's step back a little and, and take a look at the online art marketing in general. I would risk to say that the art commerce falls behind with the digitalizations compared to the related fields or any kind of business, for example, fashion or even design. But I guess it has its own reasons uh, and the market actors um, unwillingness to, to go with the 21st century. Um, for, because we all got used to buying, for example, shoes online, which was for me at least was very weird 10 years ago because I couldn't imagine. I mean, I want to try that one. I want to look at it. But now it's absolutely normal. Um, I think now this is pretty much the same phenomenon with, with, with art for me or for anybody that, you know, if you can't see it, if you can't touch it, if you if you are not there, if you don't have the experience, then it's, it's a little strange to us. Um, so art business, we can say is traditionally conducted still live and physically, so not offline, um, as to say. Um, what are your thoughts about it? What are your thoughts about the, the user experience uh, connected to this whole art business um, and, and the online um, sales? So the art world has definitely lagged behind other industries. Um, I would say specifically the commercial art world because, you know, museums have been experimenting with virtual reality yeah. probably for the last decade as a response to audiences who wanted to interact with art in new ways. Um, and it's rare in an industry that the nonprofits are ahead of for profits, um, especially in, in technological innovation. Um, auction houses too have been much better about building out the digital teams, understanding online user behavior. Um, and galleries have, have held back. I would say the pandemic was the long coming push that they needed to, to start utilizing the tools that other industries like fashion um, have used since a long time now um, to, to reach their existing client base and to meet potential new collectors. Right. Um, yeah, as you mentioned that um, slowly we are coming up as well. <laughs> In the last decade, uh, comprehensive uh, online art platforms such as Artsy grew from small startups to successful international firms. You yourself worked uh, for them uh, for a longer time. Uh, Sachi, uh, world famous Sachi, created its own uh, Sachi Art and they labeled it as the world's leading online gallery. Uh, there are online only auction houses such as Pedal 8. And uh, you can also buy fine art at Amazon if you want, which is so very funny in a way. It's not it's good, but still it's money. Uh, what is the key to, to these, uh, the, these platform success? Um, and um, yeah, why should I buy on, uh, online art? And how can they kind of convince me? What do you think? Well, I think from the collector's perspective, um, there are lots of advantages to buying online. Or let me put better, not necessarily buying, but um, discovering and mm -hmm. exploring online because a lot of times the transactions on artsy and artnet they still happen offline but they become a place of discovery and then maybe you see a piece on artsy then you pick up the phone call the gallery and go visit and it's sort of it's it's an entry point because it's convenient um it's efficient you know it's easier to search and browse um it's there's price transparency, which walking into an art gallery, you don't always get that. And it's also, you know, if you're a new collector, it, it's intimidating to walk into an art gallery and ask how much a piece costs. And price transparency removes sometimes pointless barriers. Um, it's, it's a roadblock that collectors cite. A lot of times they thought the work was more expensive than it actually is. And so it puts people off. Um, and, and access, you know, you have suddenly at your fingertips a much larger variety of art to search through from a larger uh, geographical reach as well. Um, and of course, right now, online provides the safety and comfort, and it is the only way to reach collectors at the moment if you can't walk into an art gallery. Um, so I think it has many, many clear benefits 
And companies like Artsy and Artnet were early pioneers to recognize that. And there were, let's not forget, there were many companies along the way that tried to do it, that failed. I mean, a lot of startups don't get past that that you know, funding and, and launch. But Artsy and Artnet, um, I think especially Artnet really identified this need at a, I mean, I think, when was it founded? 1998, maybe earlier, but yeah, I mean, Hans Neuendorf, the, the founder of Artnet, I think was, was really saw something and he was early for his day and it wasn't popular immediately. In fact, a lot of dealers and auction houses really didn't like the idea of a price database with transparent pricing for a very open market. Um, but that's today's buyer's expectation. Just like if I want to buy a pair of shoes, I need to see the price. I'm not going to buy it sight unseen. People expect that now. And I think for businesses that don't recognize that those expectations and try to meet those needs, they're the ones that will get left behind. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, you're saying is that, that um, so going online, um, with, with your art business doesn't necessarily mean you have to do everything online. Nowadays you can if you want. So um, let's say you have a collector in, in Japan and then you you just cannot meet him because, because of the COVID stuff and so on. You don't even have to meet uh, to conduct a business, but um, but it's it's not the point basically. The point is it's kind of this thing that, that is extra, uh, that art is more accessible to everyone and then you don't, you don't have to miss and we don't have to skip the physical part. So the nice, you know, the experience I was talking about. So this are um, the user experience because that also belongs that, if I'm, if I'm correct. Um, what do you think, uh, what percentage of art sales is conducted online um, today? This is also, I know, a difficult question because, you know, what, what does it mean that conducted online? So um, if right. you go to the gallery and then you buy later online, that's an um, but but in general, what what do you say? What is the percentage? I think online? I think in 2019, online art sales accounted for nine percent mm -hmm. of the global art market. Right. I'm very curious what 2020 will look like. Uh, I mean, I would say for the first half of 2020, it accounted for almost 100 percent of art sales um and this is also you know this year will be an exceptional year of growth and an outlier i don't think it'll skyrocket next year um but again i do think it accelerated this changing attitude and though that i think will remain permanent even once galleries open their doors and you can walk in without you know at the moment in london you know uh, an appointment yeah Okay. Um, yeah, what do you think, according to your experience, what uh, sells better online and what sells better offline? I think it's a very interesting question. So, yeah, um, this very controversial this? question. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, at Artsy, um, unique painting sold best online as a category. Okay. Um, and photography, prints, multiples, editioned works. So two-dimensional work okay. has traditionally sold better online for obvious reasons. Yeah, 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 um, sure. And in terms of price point, it's not for super high value works and it's also not for super emerging works. It's mm -hmm. the bulk of the market. It's the middle that people are comfortable with. They're comfortable maybe with the artist name or the brand name of the gallery. Um, it's, it's works they've seen before, like an addition to work. Um, and it's it's anywhere between $10,000 and $300,000. Um, and that is the bulk of the art market. It's, it's mm -hmm. the outliers are the super expensive and the super inexpensive. Um, and the super expensive or, and or the three dimensional, I think you still do need to get in front of, I say for now, because I think we're also on the cusp of some really interesting technology, especially for sculpture, that that will change that. Okay, but it's not as for now. It is not really 
the field of, for example, emerging artists or less known galleries or it's it's harder. At the same time, it's the most democratic place because you know you can be an emerging art gallery with uh, a subscription on Artsy, and you can be a very famous gallery with a subscription on Artsy, and someone can search both works equally. Yeah. But in terms of searching, it's much harder to find an artist whose name you don't know. Right. Well, actually, that was that is part of my um, next question. Um, for example, Artsy, Artnet, Artfinder, Sachi, all, all those names I was talking about, I just mentioned, these, these are very famous names, um, and there's lots of them, of course. Uh, and um, yeah, you know, um, you can get lost uh, among the different websites and the different things that offer you um, art for sale if you dive deep, uh, deeper. But apart from your natural instinct, okay, and your knowledge of the business, okay, of course, but, but as a collector, you're not necessarily familiar with, with, with the whole art world. So from your natural instinct and the, and the trust in your the well-known names, uh, what, how does a potential buyer decide um, which sites to use, where to buy, where to look around? Uh, for example, if you visit an established gallery, like physically, or you go to an art fair, this is done for you because that's what they that's what they expect you to do if you're a gallery or if you're an art fair. So kind of pre-select the. It's a it's sort of like a curated view. Yeah, yeah. It's pre vetted for you. So yeah, I think the same thing is is what people need online because artsy yeah. is too vast and there is too much and and so people are looking to you know taste makers curators. Uh, uh collectors with collections who talk about their tastes and kind of point new collectors in the right direction. And I think that's why you see these focuses on one piece as opposed to a 20, a 20 work show. Because I think what we did see during lockdown was just like an inundation of works. And then you start to sort of glaze over it, it. Like when you've been at an art fair too long and you, you can't really yeah. see the art anymore and it differentiates. Sure. So I think what we need are tastemakers who kind of direct us and tell us where to look and where to learn. Okay. But it still needs to be done, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And different, there are some sites that, that you subscribe to that sort of tell you what to see and look at. Um, much like a museum curator could walk you through a show and teach you. Um, I think a lot more education has to be done uh, as a complement to the browsing experience. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little, about, a little about figures, okay? Not so much figures in this slide because we don't want to bore our audience <laughs> with numbers, but I think it's important to, to um, take a look at that as well. So according to uh, market analysts, uh, the global sales have risen from um, 2013 from $1.5 billion to uh, $4.2 billion in 2017, which is a huge growth. It's a very rapid growth. Huge, yeah. Rapid growth, I think. But then it slowed down a little in the last two years, um, according to the figures and numbers, and it stopped at $4.8 billion uh, last year. Um, that was before Corona, okay? So not because of the coronavirus, but before that. Uh, can you explain this tendency? So why is this fir first five years of, of, of rocketing and then two years of slowing down? And, and what do you forecast in the future for the online art market? Oh, if I had a crystal ball. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, um, well, like you said, like the first growth was exponential because it was new, it was different, and you, you were growing your user base. Um, I think in the last couple of years, generally, there was a slowing of the global art economy. And so, you know, online mirrors, online, um, that, that was going to happen. Um, what there really should continue to have been, if there wasn't a pandemic, was like a, a slow, slow growth. Um, I don't think there will be a plateau, though, until... I don't know. I what? Who said? It? I think it was Art Basel. They predicted sort of by 2024, 15 percent of online art sales will account for the art market. Um, yeah, they, I they, think they, you'll continue. You'll continue to see growth because if you just look to other industries, e-commerce continues to grow. We as users become more and more comfortable buying online, transacting at larger amounts online for things of sight unseen, 
-hmm. because also technologies are getting better. So the quality of images are getting better. There's augmented reality, there's virtual reality. And so there are more and more ways to almost be in front of what you are buying. And so as that technology grows, I think people's faith in online will also grow. I think this year, of course, will be different because yeah. it was the only way to transact for at least half of the year. Um, but I, yeah, I see continual growth. Okay, let's have it that way. <laughs> um, and also, I think uh, the growth of uh, our e-commerce and art must have affected the potential audience as well, okay? So the buy potential buyers, customers, collectors. Um, what do you think? Has it broadened the range of potential buyers? Um, has it changed the geographical range or even the demographical range? So what, how does the, the online art market itself affect uh, the customers? In what way? Well, it's democratic. So, you know, if you can't afford to fly to London to come see a show or a piece, um, you can look it up online. Um, or if you can't because of mobility, um, or you're under lockdown. Um, so in terms of geography, um, I think it was um, the average distance between buyer and seller on Artsy is 2,500 miles. So, okay. so your your potential <laughs> to reach people at the farthest points of the earth is, yeah. is possible if you have an internet connection. Um, and the types of works a collector can now see, they're not local anymore, they're international. and mm -hmm. You know, I can see what what's being created um, in Africa or in Asia or Australia. Um, so, yeah, I think if it, it's broadened reach um, on every level. Okay. How about um, the demographical level? So, it would be pretty obvious and too easy to say that okay, uh, art market online and an online art business is is more for you know the uh, millennial. Um, people because of, you know, we, like, they use um, uh, online um, platforms all the time. But can we say that this is that it, it's more, it, it involves more, it, or it, um, it is for the millennials uh, exclusively? Or what about the Generation X or the boomers who are absol financially absolutely active and, and they are interested in art? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, Millennials are a huge chunk of the online market because they're the first digital generation. So, and those the millennials today are between 24 years old and 39 years old. So that's that's a pretty big part of the market that now has money to spend. Um, by 2030, millennials together will have over, I think, $4 trillion. So okay. they are definitely a force to be reckoned with and, and one that all companies should be thinking about serving. Um, and like I said before, even if you're of an older generation, which right now is a lot of times also the higher value collector, so you might not press buy online, you're certainly using the internet to discover and explore and learn and reach out and inquire. And so, yes, I'm sure the millennials are the bulk of the market. In fact, like um, at the, in the recent Art Basel report, they said 23% of millennials have never bought art in a physical space. And last year that was 18%. So that growth in just one year. So yes, they're the most comfortable, but it's not like my mother doesn't have an iPhone. You know, my grandmother has an iPad. So I I think if you're a, a, a true collector, you will consume art in all the channels, no matter what age you are. Yeah, I can. And how about uh, the country effect? So um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, the, the uh, buyers themselves, um, they have effect on the market itself. So what are, what are these effects? So how can we shape the market if we are the buyers, the collectors? So I think it's what we as consumers expect is you know, we expect high quality images. We expect 
multiple images. We expect exhaustive information and instant access to information. Um, so it's it's the sort of the production value that galleries are have to deliver now, um, and and the experiential, and what they're delivering is is higher quality experiences of their artworks and sharing their artworks in multiple channels because today's consumer expects that. And if you're a gallery or art business who isn't doing that, there's a hundred next to you that are. And so, and yeah. because, you know, I, I, the average time a person spends on a website is 90 seconds or, or nine, I think it's 90 to two minutes. Yeah. And so, in order to hook that collector quickly, what you need to be constantly churning out is interesting and engaging content to tell yes. your story. And you have to be very flexible, I think, with all the new technologies and, and changes. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, there's also something else that is currently uh, shaping the market. Um, and it is the potential winner for the word of the year 2020, I think. It is the COVID-19, the coronavirus or the pandemic, whichever phrase you like. It is pretty obvious that uh, this year has been hard on the art world in general. So financially less stable art institutions like galleries, museums and stuff uh, had to close down for good sometimes. Art fairs and exhibitions were postponed or even canceled um, and sales dropped in general, I think. Maybe that's not true um, in the end. Um, how has the virus and the resulting lockdown um, affect the online market uh, immediately in the spring and, and on the longer run, for example, by, by now? Um, and what is your forecast um, for the future, for example, for next year? So these three phases, what do you think about that? Well, what you said before actually was interesting because what do you count as an online sale? Yeah. Because Technically, um, if you're a gallery and you sent over a PDF, a pricing PDF before a show, before your collector was in front of the piece, that's an online sale because you sent them an email and it was digital and nothing happened in person. So, I yeah, I sometimes, I, you know, we, we actually could credit a lot to online that, that we don't at the moment. Um, but online in the sense that you're referring to, um, I think that, well, I don't know. It, m most immediately in the spring, actually, I saw collectors transacting like crazy. Um, they were at home looking at their walls. Uh, they, I think there was a big, there was a really nice surge of loyalty um, and support for galleries and for artists. Um, I hope that continues and sustains itself. Um, it helps that pockets of the world are reopening, at least temporarily right now. And uh, of course, sales are down. Um, you know, galleries lost art fairs, which was a major, major transaction point for them every year, multiple times of a year, and that's been removed. Um, on the flip side, without the costs of going to an art fair, um, anything you put online that did sell, you could see almost as pure profit because, you didn't ship it anywhere. There were no transit costs. Um, that will never replace, I think, what in the short term what, what was just lost in, in terms of, of, of market. Yeah, actually, um, I heard a podcast with, with Mark Steib, the um, director of the Artsy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he, he said very similar things that, uh, that you are saying, that, that along with these unfortunate consequences of the pandemic and the sufferings of certain institutions and the art world, and the world itself, of course, there are numerous positive uh, outcomes of, of this. And uh, he mentioned three things, actually, that, um, um, that the term, which out of which the ten, uh, transparency was a very important one. He said that, that, uh, I, that it's very important that customers can see the prices and galleries started to become more and more transparent with uh, with that. Um, it's, I think it's it's a very controversial thing. Uh, I see that galleries tend not to um, be happy with with disclosing prices sometimes. So, for example, if you go to an art fair, there are some galleries that put the prices on it, but you know it's kind of well, it's it's you don't have to do it. 
some of them, they just simply don't. Um, do you think, uh, is it an um, improving tendency and do you think the art world can become really uh, more transparent even on art fairs, for example, or even in the galleries towards the customers and it can build a little more trust? Um, yeah, I, I mean, whether they like it or not, I think they will be forced to um, because that that's what we expect, you know? Mm -hmm. we. We, the consumer, expect to be treated with respect upfront, and people like to do their homework in advance of asking questions. Um, also, for galleries, they will see a quicker sales cycle. It's a quicker sale because that's one less question. And when you get that interested buyer, it's a more qualified buyer because they've already seen the price and they still want to talk. So. Uh, yes, I, I'm very much on the price transparency train. Um, and, you know, with with Freeze and our Basel making it mandatory now in their online viewing rooms, that price is transparent, yeah. perhaps a price range. Um, I think it, it, it has gotten more galleries and artists more comfortable with that concept. Okay. Um, I think you've mentioned before, but but I think uh, it's important to state again that um, uh, what do you think about this growth, this um, casual growth of the uh, uh, online sales during the this uh, during the coronavirus or the, the lockdown period? Do you think it's only um, caused by this phenomenon that people couldn't travel, couldn't go to exhibitions, galleries? They were sitting at home and staring at some remaining blank walls they want to fill with some artworks with. Or, or it can cause or, you know, um, start a new uh, era of, of, uh, of stronger online um, market just because it has started because of the virus. I mean, I think this was all coming. Um, I think in a very condensed amount of time, the art world, the art market went on hyperdrive and yes. accelerated to be on a little bit more on par with auction houses, for example. And I don't think that's going away. And I don't think that investment in digital will slow down or disappear once the virus comes under control. Um, and, and you know, uh, Sotheby's and Christie's are live streaming auctions and setting records. And they've done away with sales catalogs for a lot of their department's categories. And these were things they were they were doing for years and now they've proven they can still be successful having done this. Um, and again, it's, it's about serving today's collector and the collector of tomorrow. And the collector of tomorrow is a digital first generation. And so you have to put your best foot forward and you have to position yourself in the places that those new young collectors will meet you, and that's online. Okay, so we have to keep on going in this online field. Uh, art Market Budapest is an art fair, uh, is a very important actor, actor in the regional market, as well as our exhibitors who come from the five continents of the world. And as such, we are very much interested to try to keep up with the uh, current tendencies and look into the future progress of the global online, market, or global online market. For example, at the end of October, along with uh, organizing Art Market Budapest physically, so live, so we are really preparing to go live and, and having the event itself, uh, we will launch our first online viewing room. So this is, this is very be. exciting. And it's not only because of the COVID. It, it's a, as the, the thing you were talking about, basically, that it kind of boosted, it kind of started it, but but we, we do think it's very timely and important to to open Absolutely. up to people who cannot come here now and, and in the future who cannot come and also or or just want to want to um, see this artworks for life. And, and why not? And, and like my question always was, you know, and why would you? cut off an arm another way to meet new people yeah sure sure absolutely and um yeah and so this would be our, our last topic uh that um, i'm very happy, happy to have an, an, a professional here who can talk about with uh, tips and hints and some advice for ourselves and our, our galleries our partners all over the world uh so uh, if we want to improve our online presence um, what we should do. 
um, it, it, even itself, going online is a very interesting phrase because, you know, every gallery, each art fair, auction house, artists, they have, everyone has their websites, their Facebook accounts, Instagram, you name it, everything. What does really mean going, you know, super online? So what do we have to do to meet the expectations of the um, online market and, and the customers? Well, from a perspective of an art fair, um, I think what art fairs really are, are these incredible sort of water cooler moments for the industry where galleries, curators, collectors, everyone can meet in one place. And mm -hmm. when you can't do that in real life, I think the void that art fairs really have to fill is how can you create opportunities for galleries to meet new collectors online? And that's hard. That's really hard. And I, I think that's, that's where a lot of uh, art fairs are trying to, to make inroads because that is a very unique thing that art fairs do is that you are this meeting place and of all walks of the market. And, when you can't meet on uh, offline, how do you meet online and make significant yeah. connections? And that's really, that's hard. And I think things like online viewing rooms, live chat, things like this, that is a really great step in that direction. Um, and I think for any business going online, it's, it's creating in-depth storytelling and context for those works in ways that you can't do physically. And so like I have found that the, the, the pitfalls for galleries, for example, are the ones who are so focused on replicating the physical gallery experience because you can't. Um, there is, you just can't. And I'd rather not. Um, I'd rather walk through a physical art gallery, but what I can learn online that I can't in an exhibition physically are um, insights for, into an artist's practice, perhaps, and and conveying like an almost um, uh, almost lifelike sense of of uh, the medium that they're using. And there's stories and history and context that you can build, and you have time to build online and space to build online that you can't do physically. And that's I think where where online can really work as a as a complement to what's happening in real life yeah exactly um you recently collaborated with a company developing ai solutions for the art market um and uh, i think more and more galleries and institutions realize that that uh, the ar and vr technologies are kind of inevitable for especially in an area like that when you cannot enter physically um, gallery for example several hungarian galleries have adapted some new technologies during the lockdown they had uh, several openings um, virtual exhibitions mm -hmm. uh, and they said that it was successful so we have some um, uh, good good examples uh, how does the vr and the ar um, technology assist um, sales in art and do you think they can kind of substitute this physical experience or how does it relate to it and do they pay off? Um, so, so augmented reality, AR, is visual overlay. So that's putting a piece into your personal surroundings. That I think is the, the more easier of the two because at the moment, most people have smartphones and tablets. And so you can virtually hang a piece on your wall, um, yeah. or you can place a, a sculpture on your table with a 3D model with your phone. Um, and being able to bring art into someone's home and simulate it, that's, that's I think, I think AR is very easy in terms of a technological jump. VR is obviously a much better quality viewing experience but the hurdle is getting people to put on a headset. And yeah. I don't think everyone's ready to do that yet. Um, what it does do is it simulates an environment, any environment that, that you choose, and 
you can properly interact with a piece and walk around it. And that's incredible. And and what the company I was helping launch, Vortic, um, what they what they're doing is incredible. Um, and it, it's early for this market. And uh, but again, we we've seen this in other industries in real estate. Uh, in cars, you know, online car companies, you can virtually sit in the car you're going to buy online. Um, so why couldn't you do that with art? Um, I think standing in front of a, a painting and seeing the texture and the, the patina and, and smelling the paint, that fully immersive technology, we're not there yet. But like I said at the very beginning, we are on the cusp of for example, mapping texture. So in some industries, in fashion, for example, they're developing these gloves. You can put them on and you can feel the material of the clothing you're going to buy. Um, so, which is uh, like mind blowing. Um, so we're not quite there yet. It's a hardware issue and a software issue. But with things like 5G, like a 5G network, we're getting closer and closer to that type of technology being much more, I think, imaginable in a in a in a normal selling experience. Okay, so you say that um, starting with some the AR solutions can be a good step for any yeah. something. But Absolutely. It's becoming a must in the next couple of years, I guess, as I see. I mean, you know, Artsy actually launched um, AR on their app uh, two years ago. So you yes. can virtually hang a painting on your walls. Um, Listen Gallery uh, partnered with an augmented reality company um, uh, earlier this year and launched their own AR app. Um, then there's this company, Vortic, that I, I worked with. That you can download Vortic Collect and, and you can hang works and, and place three-dimensional works, more importantly, um, in your home. Um, that, I think, will become much more normalized. And, and as people become also more comfortable with the technology and the technology gets better and better, it'll be more and more user-friendly. That, I think, will be the, the first adoption for the art world. Right. Um... Let's talk about a little uh, about our small and lovely country. Hungary is a small market, uh, even in the region. Um, the region is a small market compared to you know Asia and the US and, and, and the Europe itself. But I think uh, with establishing a strong online presence, each of these institutions, galleries, markets, um, fairs, everybody can have reach new audiences and, and markets, even on the other side of the world. Um, what are your tips for, um, if, if you were a Hungarian gallery, if you were to advise a Hungarian gallery, what were your tips for, for them to, to, you know, step this further away? Well, I think we'll see more and more that ha growing your team internally means having someone digital, digitally savvy on your team. And so hopefully that's someone who both knows how to disseminate information, but also produces so can make good video can you know can cut a good video can take a really good photograph but then knows what channels to put it on so i think digital teams will become very normal in art businesses um i think for any gallery uh, a very overlooked um uh, system would be having a good client relationship management system so a crm uh, which is um, not very sexy, but very instrumental for sales yeah. teams. Um, I think one thing we saw with the pandemic especially was cloud-based services. So okay. not dialing into a local server because you need, you need the bandwidth, you want to have the flexibility, and if you're growing internationally, um, you want to be able to collaborate in real time. Um, and then I think equally importantly is understanding your analytics because analytics and the data, that is the insight into your online user's behavior. And when you understand that, you'll understand what they're looking for and what to give them. Okay. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh
One more question, one last question. Um, what is your view on, uh, on cooperation between the different actors, the different members of the art market, such as galleries, auction houses, art fairs, and artists them th themselves, to boost online sales and boost the, um, the um, online art market uh, itself and, and mutual profit? Um, recently, we could hear about, for example, a very nice example of the New York-based David's Werner Gallery, who used their own online platform, share their own online platform with other galleries who couldn't afford to um, buy one or to um, yeah, uh, make one. And um, so they, they could use it during the quarantine and, and, uh, and they, it resulted in a high, high number of sales for all the participants. It's just a very good example, I think, and a very well-known one, which made really good PR for the, for the gallery itself, I think. Uh, so, so what is your view about this? How can how can members uh, of of the market cooperate? Um, um, I, I was going to use that very example, actually. I am um, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I think that cooperation is always mutually beneficial, and of course, Swerner helped these little galleries, but they got great press. Here we are talking about it, as you know, evidence. Um, great site traffic to their own website. It's great for brand awareness. Um, so it was definitely mutually beneficial. Um, and I think the sharing of knowledge and resources, sometimes with what would on the surface be a competitor, actually proves to be quite valuable. And you know, you've seen it with things like um, condo. So condo is is, you know, where where a gal condo London was when, London galleries offered their space up for a month to galleries from all over the world mm -hmm. and and vice versa. And you forge new relationships in different places and expand your own market. And a lot of times the introductions you make can lead to very unexpected places. So yeah, I, I think that the sharing of knowledge and resources is always a good thing. And and prob and hopefully uh, mutually beneficial and, and there's a profit to be had for both of you. Yeah. Well, I think it's a very good goodbye message. I'm really thankful for that. And I hope all our, um, the audience and all our partners will really benefit from it. And it would be really lovely to continue, but um, and because there's so, so much still in this topic, I guess, but I'm afraid we have to wrap it up here and we have to let you go. I really enjoyed talking to you, Syria. It was really, really nice. And I hope you had a good time too. I had a great time. It was a real pleasure. Okay, and we can see in person sometimes at Art Market Budapest or in general in anywhere in the world because I think we can conclude that uh, while going online is vital in the art business for all artists, for all participants, but the personal encounters are just as important and keeps things running. Absolutely. Thank you again, Surya. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, and uh, thanks to everyone for watching and uh, who was here with us today. Uh, we are coming back soon with another episode. There are two more talks planned um, before the opening of Art Market Budapest, uh, which will have its 10th edition um, in October, at the end of October, between the 22nd and the 25th of October, at the usual venue, Milan Arish. Um, please come and visit us and stay tuned for our online version if you can participate for obvious reasons this year. Details are coming soon on our website and here on our Facebook account as well. Thank you again and have a lovely September.